Bible Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Good morning. Our speaker this morning is Major General Robert F. Dees, retired from U.S. Army. He is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, Indus Industrial College of the Armed Forces, the Royal College of Defense Studies. I think he's been trained. <laughs> General Dees served in a wide variety of command and staff positions. During his military career, he and Mrs. Dees also served as the Uniformed Ambassador for Christ with the USA Officers Christian Fellowship, the Association of Christian Conferences and Teaching Services, and numerous other missionary organizations. After his retirement in 2003, he worked at Microsoft as Executive Director of Defense Strategies. In 2005, General Dees assumed his current role as Executive Director of Campus Crusade for Christ Military Ministry. Bob and Kathleen have been blessed with two married children and five grandchildren. They currently live in Williamsburg, Virginia. Bob, it's great to have you back on our campus. Would you join me in welcoming uh, General Dees? Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Uh, Mark, it's good to be back on the campus, and uh, it's good to be back with some friends I see already in the audience and things. Uh, well, the most important part of that introduction you heard, I'm sure, was about the grandchildren. You heard five grandchildren. And, and uh, my son and his uh, three children were just at Texas A&M. He was a grad student there, and they've now gone to West Point, where he's on faculty. But we took them through a little place called WB Ranch near Fort Hood, Texas, and uh, their little five-year-old, Brenny, was at WB, and he just loved it, and they'd been in College Station, and Texas was great. So when he got to New York, uh, his mom noticed that he was a bit sullen, and what is it, Brenny? What's the matter? And he said, Mom, I just wish I could have died and gone straight from Texas to heaven. So, <laughs> so, so uh, he was brainwashed at an early age uh, about uh, this thing called Texas. Uh, before I dive in, I'm reminded Andy Seidel is kind enough to host a brown bag lunch at 11.30 today where we'll share some more about military ministry and things. And then I think at uh, 12.30 I'll be with the, the staff, as, as I understand. So look forward to that. Uh, also, by way of intro, uh, my bride of 35-ish uh, years uh, is here. Kathleen, would you rise, please? And uh, as, 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 She's, uh, Kathleen is emblematic of uh, military wives. You just got to love them. They say there's nothing harder than loving a soldier, and so it is. You know, it's easy to be out on the front with the, the, the thrill of the chase, but when you're back home with uh, young children changing diapers or this or this or this, all the pressures back at home are much harder. And so God bless Kathleen for moving us 23 times in 31 years and helping to raise our children and all those things. So we, we love those military brides and now military husbands. And also we have with us Barbara Peak, uh, this uh, red-haired uh, lady up here, uh, works f uh, with military ministry. She's really sort of the heartthrob of what we do, and we appreciate having you here, Barbara, and she's here to answer questions and things afterwards. Uh, well, I, I first want to render honor to whom honor is due, and obviously the first one is the Lord Jesus Christ, who we all serve. Uh, I'll discuss that more in a moment. Uh, secondly, I want to honor Dallas Theological Seminary. I, it's really good to be back, and I just want to applaud the work you do here. Uh, you bring the relevance of God's Word in every form, every fashion, to the world. And I'm seeing that. I just want to play back to you. Uh, two of our prominent leaders within our own ministry, our leader in Europe, Jim Fishback, is a DTS grad. Our deputy national director, who, who has supervision of over 300 staff in the United States uh, military work, uh, is uh, David Preston who was uh, with Mark, one of your students along the way. So God bless these DTS grads within our own ministry, and then we're working with Dallas Theological trained uh, chaplains every day of the week, and they're doing wonderful work out there in the foxholes, in the trenches, on the flight lines, and they are being extremely relevant. So, And it's all because they've been well-trained here, they've been brought up right, uh, they understand how to rightly divide the Word of God, and that's really powerful when you get out into uh, the military forces. There's something that says in the military, uh, you know, light shines best in darkness. Another expression, threat clears a man's head. And the uniform military men and women in our armed forces have very clear heads. And so they quickly perceive the relevance of the Word of God. 
and it shines brightly in their lives, and it provides an anchor for the soul, which they all seek, particularly in these days of war in our nation. Uh, also, in honoring DTS, I would honor a couple that are near and dear to me. <laughs> I won't be able to make it through this without a few tears, so hang in there with me. Um, in, in 1968, young plea Bob Dees and his girlfriend at the time, Kathleen, uh, I, I went into West Point as a young plebe, and somebody wrapped their arm around me and started feeding me enchilada dinners. And this young boy from Texas, I was from Bel Air High School in Houston, and, and uh, as it turned out, this guy over here was from Bel Air High School. So they mentored us for four years, and they taught us about the Word of God, and they put us through a spiritual boot camp. And then they gave us the greatest gift anyone could have given us. They said, you're going off into your military marketplace in uniform and you're going to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And so that was the wonderful gift and we thank Gail and Andy Seidel. Let's give them a pause. So that was the hardest part of the whole speech. Now we're good to rock and roll here. Okay. Uh, Secondly, I think I ought to honor our troops and our families. I know you do, but uh, the question you have to ask is, where would we be without them? What, what would have happened if the troops at Bunker Hill had not decided they wanted to take the day off and they hadn't shown up, those great patriots that helped with the institution of, of our nation? Or how about if Normandy, they said the folks uh, were going to unhinge a, a whole continent from an evil empire. Perhaps they just said, well, let's don't show up today. It's going to be a bit rainy out there. The, the surf is high. Let's don't do Normandy today. You, you can understand the point I'm making. Where would we be without our great soldiers we, and sailors, airmen, marines, coast Guardmen, and their families? We would not be the land of the free and the home of the brave. And so we have a great debt of gratitude. I do, I know you do, as, as citizens of this great nation. Uh, where would we be without them? We would not be where we are today. And that must be the same in the future. You know, our military is the exoderma of our country. They're the outer skin. They protect the internal organs. And as such, they sometimes are bruised and cut and bleed, and yes, they even die on our behalf. And so we, we do owe a great debt of gratitude to our veterans. Um, now, how do we help these veterans is the real question. And that's what uh, we in Campus Crusade Military Ministry wrestle with. What I want to do uh, this morning is very briefly, I want to cover some scripture that I think is relevant to this. And then I want to tell you uh, how we're uh, applying this scripture to some particular issues within the military uh, force today. So the scripture I'm interested in today is Luke 18, 35 through 43. It's, uh, I'm fascinated by the uh, renditions of, not the renditions, the different episodes of Christ healing blind people in the scriptures. And you go to John 9, you know, and in John 9 it says, well, I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know what all the physics of it, but that's what happened experientially to me. And Jesus Christ touched that man's heart. And then you go to Mark 8, and there's another healing, but that was a gradual healing. And that's the one where he says, I see people walking about like trees. And so they reapplied, and then the, finally there was clarity. And it says Christ took the man out uh, to the city to a quiet place. He took him by the hand to a quiet place outside the city. Well, why was that? Jesus Christ understood that particular person's make. He understood what he could handle, what he couldn't handle as he was healed. And so Christ, the ultimate leader, understood the characteristics of each person he dealt with. And so we get to, then to Luke 18. And it's one of these typical things. I'll, I'll read through it briefly and then uh, a couple of uh, points out of it. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? Not a very complicated question. And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Pretty simple answer. And Jesus said, receive your sight, your faith. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Uh, so I think that's a, a fascinating story again. Jesus Christ, walking through this crowd of hundreds, uh, had the perception of the center of gravity of that whole situation to perceive that one person that was uh, needing a, a healing touch, both physically and spiritually, 
He perceived that center of gravity and then he acted upon it. And I, and I draw three points. I'm, I'm going to be rocking and rolling here. So, and, and certainly with, with in front of your faculty, I would not to try to dissect this in the Greek and Latin and all that, which I could not do anyway. But, but let me tell you what I might pull out of this. Uh, three things. One, um, I think uh, a person like Jesus and then people like us who seek to be bridges of healing, leading people to God the healer in various ways in their lives, spiritual and healing, physical healing. Uh, bridges of healing think systemically to engage and change the system. Jesus Christ was always thinking strategically as he acted tactically. Um, the, the observers there, they were saying, stick with the status quo, don't risk it, you'll embarrass us, be quiet. Uh, but Jesus identified the center of gravity. And that center of gravity, as you see at the end, it says, and, all, and the people, they gave praise to God. So that's one person, that tactical healing led to a strategic change in the tenor of that whole population. So that's pretty powerful. The second point I would bring out of it is that Jesus and then the, anybody like us who seek to be bridges of healing work compassionately to restore wholeness to the whole person. Christ didn't just say, uh, uh, have faith or may you be healed spiritually, but he healed his physical blindness. He dealt with the physical need and then he dealt with the spiritual need, both the sight, the physical sight, and the spiritual sight. Now, in, in my mind, that sort of uh, refers to the intersection of the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And I think it's an interesting discussion these days, and, uh, and no doubt you all have been thinking a lot about it. As I'm in mission work, I see it all the time. I see that there's a ditch on both sides of the road. Uh, you can have a wonderful humanitarian operation, and you can be uh, certainly loving God and loving your neighbor in a lot of humanitarian outreach, but there's a ditch on that side of the road in that if you, if you go totally in that ditch, uh, you sort of forget about the relevance of the gospel and the relevance of life transformation and the reality of eternity as well as the temporal. And so you want to stay out of that ditch. And yet on the other side, if you're so heavenly, uh, or what do they say, so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, then, then there's a ditch over there too. And if you're, you're whipping the four laws on them, uh, when, when in, in light of their human need, they, they simply can't have the attention, place the focus on that, then perhaps that's uh, an extreme in the other direction. So the question for me uh, as a ministry and perhaps for you as ministers is how do you stay in the, in the middle of that road between those two intersections, those two ditches, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, and how do you combine those in proper balance as you go through? And certainly it's different ways at different times, different target audiences, populations, and things. Uh, a third thing I would draw out of this is that I think uh, Jesus Christ certainly and, and Bridges overall affirm the faith and the resources of the one who was healed. We have to be awful careful as we minister uh, that we send people out uh, holistically and not uh, codependent upon us or upon some mechanism that we've put in place in their lives. We want these people that are healed to be dependent upon the living God and his mercies and gifts to them rather than dependent upon us. And so the healing becomes a blessing not only to them, but to others. Uh, I, th I think of the, the passage in John 21 where Jesus Christ, uh, it was a fishing story. And they're hauling the fish to shore. And a little verse in there says, and Christ had some fish on the fire. And, and so he had sort of prepared it himself, it sounded like. No doubt divine fish and everything laid out ready for their breakfast. And, but profoundly it says, when they bring the fish to shore, he says, come, let us have some of the fish which you have caught. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, uh, it, perhaps he takes his divine fish off that fire and he says, bring some of the fish which you have caught, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. Put those on the fire. We're going to choose to need you, choose to use you, which is what Jesus Christ does. He empowers people. And so we in ministry, as a third point out of this, we want to empower others rather than make them codependent upon us. Now, I think those are all critical points as, as I now dive into, okay, military ministry, Campus Crusade for Christ, what is that all about? Uh, the value proposition, as many of you might appreciate, is that the military marketplace and the military of any nation is incredibly strategic. It is a moral change agent. It is a strategic influencer. It is an unreached people's group. It is a target population, I would offer, in the United States and what I'm seeing in militaries around the world that is pregnant with revival. There are spiritual movements underway in the military of the U.S. Armed Forces and the military of other uh, countries around the world that are just incredible, and I'll talk a bit about that. And why is that? Well, some of the premises I said earlier. Threat clears a man's head. Light shines best in darkness. 
the sons and daughters of uniform uh, in uniform in the American Armed Forces recognize they are probably headed to harm's way and they need an anchor for the soul and so it is that we in Campus Crusade Military Ministry seek to give them an anchor for the soul our vision is to transform the nations of the world through the militaries of the world now we don't I mean, we don't transform a nation by ourselves obviously but this is a strategic marketplace ministry if you will the militaries of the world uh, if you get it right in the military you can generally get it right in a nation if it goes wrong it goes horribly horribly wrong witness Burundi, Eritrea, Sierra Leone, etc. And so we seek to transform nations through the militaries. And our approach is, might, you might say, twofold. We recognize an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Everything that we can build into that military person from the very beginning is money in the bank. It, it allows him to view life through a biblical, a scriptural grid that changes uh, his whole resiliency. Uh, which is a psychological term that I'll allude back to in a moment when we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. So the ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, very, very important. We have six pillars in military ministry. We try to reach our recruits immediately. There are 450,000 recruits in the freshman class of this next year's armed forces. That's going through boot camp. We will touch about 200,000 of them this next year with our staff. We have staff at half of the nation's boot camps. This last year, uh, we, we hope the numbers will be larger next year, but this last year, 15,000 plus came to saving faith of Jesus Christ in the boot camps. And then our staff has the privilege and the responsibility to help them become lifetime laborers in God's vineyard. Now that's pretty cool, because in, in the boot camps, they are, military, uh, they are mentally transformed, and they are physically transformed. They'll be able to do a lot more push-ups. But, but, but our desire is that they also be spiritually transformed for their lifetime. And, and it's such a, a point of vulnerability, it's such a transition point in their whole lives that it is a very teachable moment. And so we're, we're finding that to be the case, and uh, then it, it's, that's awful exciting. Those leaders, I mean those soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, need leaders. And so we also have a complementary ministry on college campuses and at places like Texas A&M, at the military academies. Uh, we want leaders to lead like Jesus. We want leaders in the 21st century to be able to be servant leaders and to be able to take care of their people and, and lay down their lives uh, for their people the way Jesus did. Uh, we have 80 college ROTC campus ministries right now. It's powerful to see. Because we're aligned with Campus Crusade, we, we're not starting at zero with any of these ventures, but we, we go into a college campus, and if there's already a Campus Crusade infrastructure there, then we simply empower them, they empower us, and we're rocking and rolling. Uh, I'll mention the same dynamic uh, internationally in a moment. Uh, our third pillar of ministry, if you will, is to stop the unraveling of the American military family. I wish I could say it differently. Divorce rates are up. 7,000 three years ago, 7,500, 10,000 this year. Is it going to be 15,000, 20,000? It's almost exponential in the increase of divorces. The compounding effect of multiple deployments, particularly in the Army, the 15-month tour that they now are reducing to 12 months, has had a tremendous effect. Uh, the suicide rates have been uh, increasing. In the Army this year, highest suicide rates ever. Two chaplains committed suicide. 121 soldiers committed suicide this last year. That's loss of hope. I'll talk about hope in a minute. That's loss of hope. And then, uh, how many uh, attempted? 2,100 attempted suicide. Uh, that's uh, more than five soldiers a day attempting suicide. And so when we talk about the relevance of the gospel, the relevance of uh, the Word of God, you can appreciate in this environment uh, how people are so hungry, so thirsty, how we need ministers of the gospel in every form, church and parachurch out there uh, getting the word of God to the military men and women that, that we serve. Uh, the fourth uh, pillar is uh, armed troops in harm's way with spiritual resources. Uh, since 9-11, we've passed out 1.85 million rapid deployment kits, all packed by volunteers. It's uh, a New Testament uh, approved both by the Protestant and Catholic churches. Uh, it's a uh, how to know God personally, and it's a daily bread uh, specifically designed for the military. 1.85 million in cargo pockets. And you, should, you can appreciate, and, and DTS would certainly appreciate this, the Word of God is powerful and alive and sharper than two-edged sword, uh, seeking to pierce the sun between soul and spirit. And uh, we get uh, reports from the battlefront that are just incredible about not only the Word of God being the bread of life, but the Word of God being the very thread of life that helps keep people together, helps them have the will to live while they're on the operating table, etc. Uh, the fifth pillar is uh, the internet is a powerful force for good or for evil. 
uh, we recognize that troops of today spend more time on the internet than they spend in a church or a chapel. And so how do we reach them through this new medium? We're trying to learn just the way everybody else is. We have evangelistic websites. Uh, we buy Google words that drive people to those websites more with greater probability. And then we connect them with online counselors. Uh, again, some amazing things. We saw over 10,000 this last year that made online decisions for Christ went on and, and went through that process. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm learning about this. Now, those 10,000 online decisions, are those equal to 10,000 personal decisions? I don't know. Uh, in this day and age, in the media that our, this generation is learning in, it may be that those are more valid because they're more vulnerable and more open and more uh, willing to dialogue and go to the next steps. I simply don't know, but it's, a, it's an amazing dynamic, and so we've become all things to all people that we might win some through the Internet. And then the sixth pillar is applying what I've discussed already to the international stage. We're involved in 20 countries uh, right now, and uh, the same proposition, transforming the nations of the world through the militaries of the world. And Kenya is our largest work. We have uh, uh, 15 new life training centers in Kenya. These are sort of uh, discipleship and evangelism training of military personnel, vicinity military bases. We have over 90 trainers of trainers in Kenya. They crank this, it's just amazing. Bill Bright, you know the, the founder of Campus Crusade. Kathleen and I were in Kenya uh, last time. And uh, Bill Bright would have been so uh, amazed with perfect fidelity. Here were these Kenyans that had been trained and trained and trained. So they're four, five, six generations down, uh, reciting the four laws with perfect fidelity, uh, playing back transferable concepts of ministry with perfect fidelity. And so the simplicity that Bill, through the power of God, put into the Campus Crusade vernacular uh, continues today in these countries all around the world. And as you know, Campus Crusade, largest uh, missionary organization, 26,000, most of those outside the United States today. Um, so that's the six pillars. Uh, now, uh, we have, uh, as I apply this scripture to what we do today, the question is, uh, what does it mean uh, for uh, today. Well, the wounds of war are difficult. Everybody that goes to war comes back wounded. And when they come back wounded, some of them you can see, some of them you can't see, some of them heal a short time, some of them heal a long time. Some of them have to heal from the inside out. They're the wounds of the heart, the soul, the spirit. It's this thing you've been reading about, post-traumatic stress disorder and other impacts of combat trauma. Bottom line related to that, we have identified that pain, most relevant need of the U.S. Armed Forces. We've determined to march to that pain. We've established program to do that. Uh, there's a, you can go on our website, uh, ptsdhealing.org or militaryministry.org and learn more about these things. Uh, but the, the combat trauma issue of today lends itself to spiritual solutions. Never have I seen a more relevant intersection of the pain of people in a particular sector, the military, uh, and the relevance of the gospel than there is today around this issue of post-traumatic stress because it is inherently has spiritual roots to it and it inherently lends itself to Christ-centered solutions for combat trauma. We have a video called Bridges to Healing. It talks about how we all can be bridges of healing, big ones or little ones. Uh, we also have developed a combat trauma healing manual. We, we recognized we needed a program, and so it's, a, it's a, a great book. It's been adopted by the Dobson community worldwide, Focus on the Family. It's been every Baptist chaplain has one in their hand in the military, et cetera. It's starting to get good traction. Uh, it just testifies to the relevance of the Word of the God of God in this darkness. We're in combination also with the American Association of Christian Counselors, 50,000 strong, largest Christian counseling organization in the world. We are developing a 30-hour video series on spiritual care for combat trauma to be finished in the fall. Our vision is to uh, mobilize thousands of churches. We have a four-hour seminar. We're teaching churches. We've uh, touched over 100 churches in the last six months. Mobilize thousands of churches and tens of thousands of lay and professional counselors through this AACC video series, putting them into the existing Christian care network so a veteran in any state, any city of the union can pick up the phone and say, I'm in trouble, I need Christian counseling. Uh, and then on behalf of hundreds of thousands of combat trauma sufferers and their families, Veterans Affairs says there's 400,000 untreated cases of combat trauma from previous wars. These are your aunts, your uncles, your fathers, your brothers, your sisters from Vietnam, from Korea, uh, from earlier conflicts in this century. Uh, you, you see all that, and then today we have one in five coming back uh, from the war with uh, serious post-traumatic stress disorder. So we have a national epidemic, and we propose a Christ-centered national solution to get at this. 
and we're seeking help, we're seeking to mobilize, not just inside the wire in the military, which is basically done, but outside the wire in the heartland of America. Because when you get to the National Guard, the Reserve, the veterans of America, uh, it is all across this land. And if we want to transform our nation, uh, I think this is a, a very relevant way to do it, to start this healing process. Uh, the reality is, I think, any nation that ignores the wounds of war, any nation that does not bind up the wounds of war, is at great peril. And so we now have a wonderful uh, requirement to bind up the wounds of war, and I say wonderful because it's an incredible opportunity for that light of Jesus Christ to shine very brightly in darkness. And I haven't addressed this, but no doubt many of you today are touched. Either you're directly involved, have been involved in the military, you have family in the military, you have relatives. I know that you've been touched and you probably uh, just inherently have a heart of compassion for that. Now what I'm gonna do, because uh, I wanna make sure y'all can go study for your uh, finals and things, uh, let, me, let me tell you one story and uh, we'll, we'll wrap here. In 1994, uh, Kathleen and I were in Holland. She was on a muddy drop zone, and I was up above in a Dutch C-130 aircraft uh, getting ready, and you know, it's, it's one minute, outboard personnel stand up, inboard personnel stand up, hook up, check static lines, check equipment, and you know it's getting serious now. You're getting ready to jump out of this airplane, perfectly good airplane that always puzzled me, you know. Okay, <laughs> but, but so you're getting ready to jump, and, and then it says, stand in the door. And he says, go, go, go. And so I won't jump off. This stage is a bit too high. But, uh, uh, and so I, I jumped off. And you have just a few minutes because this is a commemoration of Operation Market Garden. 50 years after the biggest airborne operation in Europe. It really unhinged the whole continent of Europe. Uh, began that unhinging from the Nazis. Uh, so we were at the same time, same day, 50 years later, same drop zone, jumping in Holland. Eindhoven. Uh, it was memorialized in a, a movie called Bridge Too Far, a book by Cornelius Ryan and so forth. Some of you may be familiar with it. So I was going down thinking of the great sacrifices of those veterans, some of them being shot on the way down. I landed, a Dutch lady grabbed me, and when she grabbed me, she, she just wrapped her arms. She was elderly, I couldn't understand what she was saying, she was crying. And finally we got a translator there, and the translator uh, started uh, relaying this lady's story. She said the Germans in that town of Eindhoven had been shooting five fathers a day. Uh, they would apprehend him in the morning and then shoot him at noon. And so her father in a day in September 1944 had been apprehended. And it was incredible. You know, you can imagine the travail and the family and all that. And, and, but she told the story and she burst out in great joy. She said, you know, that day my father was apprehended. The 101st Airborne Division landed at 10 o'clock in the morning. And they saved her father's life. And so I was just the first airborne soldier she could grab to thank and you can imagine that was pretty profound for both of us. And, you know, I think about that story and I recognize if I talk to those soldiers, what would they say? They would say, just doing my job, sir. I was just doing my job. Just one boot in front of another, one dusty, maybe one bloody combat boot in front of another. And what were they doing? They were changing lives. They were liberating the nation of Holland and they were unhinging whole continents from evil empires. And I would just draw an extension for you here at Dallas uh, Seminary. That's what you do. I mean, you don't have parachutes on your back, but really you are parachuting in, landing in people's lives, landing in marketplaces, landing in places all around the world with your good training, your foundation in the scriptures, and you are incredibly relevant. And then by just putting one of your combat boots, how lovely on the feet are those who bring good peace, okay, who bring news, of, good news. Of, uh, isn't that what you do? And then isn't it what you do when you go into their lives and you change lives and you actually change nations and you, by the power of the Word of God, can in fact begin the unhinging of whole continents from evil empires? That's what you and Dallas Seminary do. So God bless you for what you do. God bless you for what we do in partnership with one another. I'm out of time. Let's pray, please. Okay. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for Dallas Seminary and the pervasive impact across this world. And we thank you that it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, and to the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardman, and their families. And we pray for them today, Father. Thank you for their service of us. We pray that you'd heal the wounds of war and allow them to continue to be our nation's selfless servants. Allow us to support them and allow the word of God to go to shine brightly in their midst. It's in Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen.